Thanks, guys. It really is great to be back. It's been about 10 years since I've been here. Let's see. These are, are you all seniors, juniors, sophomores? What, what year are you guys? It's a mix. Who's the, uh, who's the oldest person here? Yeah, are you, are you uh, 17 or 18? Any 18 year old? 18, so you're old enough to vote. Good. And who's the youngest? Good. How old are you? 14. 14. Yeah. So when I was last year, you were four. That's crazy, right? But uh, I was a state senator, and now I've got a better gig, which is state attorney. And I don't know if you know what state attorney is, but it's the district attorney. You ever watch Law and Order? Uh, you ever read Batman? Harvey Dent? What was Harvey Dent's? Other name. Who's a, who's a Batman fan? What, Harvey Dent also became, he became a villain. Two-Face. Harvey Dent was the district attorney. He had my job. And then someone, who was it, the Joker? Who, who poured, someone poured acid on his face. Half his face was all messed up, so he became Two-Face, a villain. So I am still on the good side of the law. I have not turned uh, into the bad guy yet, but uh, I'm the, uh, so I'm, I'm the DA. I go after a crime. I prosecute every state crime in Palm Beach County. Now there's a difference between state crime and federal crime. Uh, give me an example, give me an example of a state crime. Shoplifting, state crime, good. Give me an example of a federal crime. The youngest guy in the room. Treason. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, good, good. Treason, yeah, we don't prosecute any treason cases. Treason, which is where you work for a hostile power, another party, to steal from the United States information, classified information, you know, you, that's, that's treason. Uh, that would not be something we would do. We would do DUIs. I know that everyone knows someone or heard of someone who had a DUI. It's actually a pretty common crime. But do you know what the most common crime in Palm Beach County is? What is the number one crime we prosecute here in Palm Beach County? I'm going to give you a hint. It's a misdemeanor. Do you all know the difference between misdemeanors and felonies? A misdemeanor is smaller potatoes. A misdemeanor is Crimes punishable by up to a year in county jail. A felony is crimes punishable by a year and a day plus in prison. So when you hear jail and prison, it's not the same thing. It's actually, there's a difference. So, okay, that's your hint. What is the most common crime in Palm Beach County? The hint is it's a misdemeanor. What do you think? More crimes, this is the most common crime. It's a misdemeanor. A third of our misdemeanors are this. You go ahead, go yell it out if you want. Speeding, it's interesting. Speeding is not a crime. So what is it? Can you go home and speed right now? No. Do you know what speeding is? The word starts with an I. An infraction. Yes. You want a job in my office? You're already 18. All right, go to law school. We're hiring. So good. You know what, what the difference between a fraction and a crime is? A crime is when you see one of us there, one of us prosecutors, where you could get jail time. If there's no Chance of jail time, it's not a crime, it's an infraction. So you go to, you ever have a speeding ticket? Anyone here ever? Oh, you don't have to, you don't have to admit to it. Right. <laughs> if you have a speeding ticket, you go to court, right? It's not a judge, no one's there in a black robe. And they come out and they're, um, you know, they say it's a hearing officer, all right. What's the worst that can happen? You get a fine, you get points on your license. Now, if you go 200 miles an hour and you're reckless, that's a crime, that's different, that's different. So, okay, speeding, but speeding's not a crime, it's an infraction. Keep going, now, I'll give you another hint. The most common crime in Palm Beach County is traffic related. DUI is close. That's traffic related. For the first time, it is a misdemeanor. Close. Yes, ma'am. Marta, how'd you know that? I ask, this, I ask groups all the time. That was pretty quick. That was awesome. Marcella. All right. So you want to be a, a lawyer? No. Okay. Well, there's all the good ones. Marcella, what, what made you think it was driving without a license? Right, right. Well, the most common crime in Palm Beach County is a crime we call DUS, driving under suspended license or driving without a license. So when you go home today, take solace knowing that many of the people driving next to you have no license or insurance. That's a crime. We will prosecute that, although rarely does anyone get jail time. What happens is we have a diversion program. I mean, we, want, we wanted people to get licenses. Get a license, get insurance, and then you can drive. But a lot of people can't get licenses because they're undocumented or they... They had marijuana. You know, in the state of Florida, if you are convicted of a marijuana possession offense, you lose your license for like, I think it's a year. It used to be two or three years. I think it's a year now, a year or two years. The marijuana doesn't even have to be in your car. It's just you can be walking around up, oh, busted, lose your license. So there are a lot of people who have lost licenses out there for other reasons. They don't pay, pay child support, you lose your license. And so we see a lot of that. 
Now, these are all good guesses. Every one of your guesses was good. I've been to other groups. I, I, I kid you not where people have guessed murder as the most common crime. If murder is a misdemeanor, I want to see what a felony is, right? Plus, if a third of all of our misdemeanors in Palm Beach County were murders, I would say move. Move anywhere but here. Get out of town. So if you live in Palm Beach County, I'm your district attorney. They call it state attorney. And I have an office of 120 prosecutors, 220 professional staff. We have about 50 volunteers, including people your age. And we give them great experience. And you get to see cool stuff. It's never dull in this county. We always have high profile cases. I mean, Tiger Woods, remember when he got his DUI? That was our office. Uh, remember Robert Kraft when he got in trouble? The owner of the New England Patriots? Yeah. Little uh, adult uh, issues he had to deal with. I'm not going to mention them here, but that was our office. Uh, do you remember, um, ever hear of a guy named Jeffrey Epstein? Yeah, that was our office. Not when I was there. That was years before. We have like Dahlia DiPolito. Uh, we have, uh, what other big high profile? Oh, uh, Real Housewives of uh, New York. You ever watch uh, The Countess? She's a Real Housewife. She got in trouble with police here in Palm Beach County, put in handcuffs. Rod Stewart, a rock star before your time, maybe. <laughs> he used to be big. Uh, we had, uh, let's see, other, other high profile. Rush Limbaugh back in the day. William Kennedy Smith. I'm sure I'm forgetting some other. Oh, Dennis Rodman. Prosecuted him. Yeah. I know you're shocked that Dennis Rodman would ever be charged with a crime, but Dennis Rodman was, he was out in Delray Beach one night and uh, some, uh, some, he was with a small group of people, including someone, he, people he didn't know, and he, a young guy was like, hey, he started talking to him or something, and then I don't know where he slaps him across the face. So <laughs> it uh, ended up in a diversion program. A lot of our cases like that, you know, end up, you know, hey, go to a class, write a letter of apology, do all these things, and you can get it wiped off your record. If it's a real low-level crime and the victim goes along. Yes, sir. Someone runs, runs around like it depends because that is not a crime. It's an infraction. So it depends on how egregious it is, to, whether it's reckless driving. You know, it, it's, these, are good, these are questions that you would get in law school where they ask you, what about this? And you have to try to come up with... You take the evidence, you take the law, and you have to make a decision. So it depends is the answer. I know that's not satisfactory, but yeah. So one of the crimes that, and this is important because Tara leads an organization, a very important one, about uh, safety for life and, and trying to uh, make our roads safer. And it's something that our office will get involved in. But you know we can't solve all the problems in the community. A lot of it's just being, uh, watching out for each other. And if you see someone who is impaired, they, they should not be driving. I know that everyone thinks, oh, you know, when you're young, you just live forever. But I've seen too many tragedies. And the best way is to prevent a tragedy from happening. Because after a tragedy occurs, we can't put all the pieces together. We can only restore a measure of justice. And that's not, unfortunately, in every case. And so you have the power, really, with peer pressure, with just being leaders that you are. Because you are all leaders to make sure that your friends do the right thing when they're out there on the roads. That is in the news a lot. And there are a lot of people saying human trafficking is when you take a young person and you drag them across the southern border with duct tape and rope and you force them into slavery. That's more Hollywood than reality. You know what really is human trafficking? It's more about exploitation than transportation. It's about people coming into your own homes through Facebook and other sites. I mean, Facebook is now for old people, right? I mean. Now you have uh, TikTok and all these other things. So they're coming through, they're Snap and other, th and, and they lure you into a life. So what happens is you have someone who comes from a, a rough background or maybe a runaway, and they have this new older boyfriend they met on social media, and now the older boyfriend's bought, all the, bought her all these new uh, gifts, jewelry, has his name tattooed on her ankle. We actually saw one case where he had his name tattooed on her eyelids. It's like a brand. And that is a sign that maybe some human trafficking, because they groom them. It's called grooming into this life. And they lead them into, well, you're going to make movies, and then it goes into prostitution, and then it's just, it's, that is the reality of sex trafficking. There's also another side to human trafficking called uh, labor trafficking, where they take people usually from other countries and they force them into forced labor. And you see that. That's actually the more common kind. But people think that when it comes to two times, remember, human trafficking is either sex trafficking or labor trafficking. 
When it comes to sex trafficking, most of the victims are actually homegrown. They're from here. People think they're from overseas. They're from here. Labor trafficking, they're really from, they're from overseas generally. And then the problem is they come from countries where the prosecutors and the police are not their friends. We are fortunate. We have a country where you can go to police and prosecutors, and we will try to help. Other countries, you go to police, and they say, all right, how much are you going to give me? And some of these other countries. Or the police are the ones committing the crimes. But in this country, you know, we have a professional law enforcement um, apparatus and prosecutors. And one other thing about that is we, prosecutors, are still separate from the police. Like in Law and Order, we're the second half of the TV show. So if someone comes in right now, a police officer comes in right now, and uh, checks your bag and says, oh, what's this? Uh, on your phone, you've got all this music you didn't pay for. That's a crime. That is. And they take you away. They would go to my office and we would drop the case. Why would we drop the case? Why would we drop that case? Yes, sir. Ah, he said the magic word. A warrant, right? What amendment to the Constitution requires police to get a warrant to search your bag. There's an, one of those amendments. It's in the Bill of Rights. Which amendment? Fifth, fifth you are close. The fifth one's got like, what? Again, you're, you're two for two. Fourth amendment. It's against unreasonable searches and seizures. Now, there are some exceptions. If, if, uh, if police get a call right now and says, hey, from a source they know, so look, there's a, uh, a student in the deacon's office, and she's wearing glasses and with a blue, uh, a, you know, a blue uh, jacket, and she has a gun in her bag. The police can come and search the bag. I mean, wouldn't you want them to? Yeah. You don't want the police to say, oh, hold on. I'm going to go to a court. We're going to apply for a warrant, and then tomorrow we're going to be able to search the bag. At that point, it's too late. That's what you call exigent circumstances, meaning emergency circumstances, and you would never have a gun in your back. But, you know, in Michigan, remember the school shooter? This guy uh, whose parents gave him a gun? Like, oh my, right? And then he was writing these crazy things on his exams. Remember, like, he, had, he was writing an exam, and uh, he was writing crazy things, and then the teacher saw it, like, he was writing, she was like, I can't help but the thoughts um, help me, help me with a gun and shooting people. They took him to the principal's office. They called the parents. The parents came in. They said, look, you got to, uh, this, this kid, your, your son uh, is really troubled. You need to get him counseling within 48 hours. The parents never said, hey, by the way, we gave him a gun. Um, the parents never searched his backpack, never asked them if he had the gun. And then when the school said, take the kid home, they said, nah, we're leaving here with you. And then he went and shot up the school. So the kid was charged with four counts of murder, and the parents are now being charged. First time parents have been charged with, with, for their kids' actions in a school shooting. So these are things prosecutors did, decisions we make all the time. And it all depends on the facts of the case. So you take the laws, and then you've got to see, you've got discretion. That's why this job is so great, because you have the discretion to do justice in every case. That prosecutor in Michigan was a new prosecutor, the district attorney, my counterpart. No parents had ever been sued, excuse me, charged criminally, ever been charged criminally for their kids' actions as far as a school shooting. That's the first, because it depends on what happens that day. So, by the way, I want to go back to the, uh, the example. If, if someone randomly called the police and said, yeah, uh, there's, uh, there's, there's a kid with a gun in, in, uh, in her book bag, would the police then be able to come in and check all of your book bags? I don't know. Maybe that what would happen would be, I think the, uh, the school be evacuated. But as far as the, the police, it depends on the situation. In the scenario I gave you, they knew the person who was calling. They had a specific description of her and what class she'd be in. So that gives you enough evidence to say, OK, I'm going to go search the book bag. But you can't just, you know, the police just can't like say, hey, uh, like, you know, you're walking down the street and say, hey, you look suspicious. I'm patting you down for guns and drugs. They've tried that in other communities. In New York, they, they did that a little more. You, can't, you just can't do that. You have to have some sort of reasonable suspicion. And race is not reasonable suspicion. That's racial profiling. What reasonable suspicion is, is you got to have some sort of evidence. So that's just part of our job. And I hope that you'll consider maybe being a prosecutor or at least a lawyer one day.
Being a prosecutor is very fulfilling. You get to have great cases. You get to do justice every day. You don't get paid as much as the private sector, but you get to wake up in the morning and say, hey, I, I'm going to do some good today and protect victims of crime. If you commit a crime here, regardless of your immigration status, you can be prosecuted for the crime. If you're visiting here, like you ever see um, in Key West, they, they have all these spring breakers. They have them uh, wearing the uh, orange jumpsuits and uh, picking up trash. These are spring breakers who come from the, whole, the rest of the country and they're underage drinking and that's how they punish them. They have to pick up trash on the side of the road. So it doesn't matter where you're from. Now, if you you could be deported if you have an immigration issue. Even if you're not a U.S. citizen, the Constitution still protects you from unreasonable searches and seizures, including the Eighth Amendment. See, the Eighth Amendment says you have a right against cruel and unusual punishment. So if the Constitution didn't apply to people who are from other countries, if they're here, then you could say, all right, well, you're not going to jail. You're going to be tortured over here because you're not an American. That's not a country you'd want. Now, by the way, um, when it comes to terrorists overseas, those, the Bill of Rights doesn't apply. There are some states that have terrorism as state crimes. Remember the kid in Michigan I told you about, the school shooter? He's also being charged with terrorism for all the kids he didn't kill, the people, the rest of the students who he terrorized. Right? He's been charged with murder for the four kids he did kill, but then all the other students had to deal with that terror. He's being charged for terrorizing them. Michigan has a terrorism law. We don't have that here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so, so the Miranda rights, you see them, they're everywhere on TV, right? You have the right to remain silent. Uh, you have the right to a, law a lawyer. If you can't afford a lawyer, one will be provided for you. Once you, you are in custody and you have no freedom to leave, then you have to read your Miranda rights. So you have to know your rights. So for example, like if the police come to you and uh, say, hey, do you mind if I search your book bag? I'll bet you just about everyone will say, that's okay, go ahead. Okay, well, you just gave consent. So the Fourth Amendment doesn't, you just gave consent. You always watch the TV shows, and the cop comes to the car and says, hmm, I think you've probably been uh, smoking marijuana. You mind if I check your car? Go ahead. Consent. Now, if, if you're in custody, and you can't leave, right? If you have no freedom to leave, then they have to give you your Miranda rights. Uh, uh, well, See, it's a little complicated. So it's a, it's a custodial interrogation, okay? Not to get too complicated, but at some point they have to give you your Miranda rights. And, uh, but what they'll do is they'll just interview you and you're free to leave. They, you, you may not know that. And then you say, hey, can I go? No, you can't. You are, you, you, you're under arrest or you must stay here. Well, at that point they have to give you your Miranda rights. You have to be told that you have the right to remain silent and be offered an attorney. And if you say, I want an attorney, they say, you don't want one. Let's keep asking questions. Then what happens is your confession gets thrown out. It gets thrown out. Doesn't mean the case goes away. It just means they can't use that confession against you. So that's why police have to be careful. Because, for example, if they search your bag and they found illegal stuff in your bag without a warrant, the evidence they find is thrown out. Doesn't mean they can't prosecute you. We, can't, we say, well, here's other evidence that we have. We have all this other stuff. Okay, we just can't use what we found. We can't use the statement you made because you weren't given your Miranda rights. Or you were, and then you know, they didn't listen to you that you asked for a lawyer, or you said, I don't want to speak anymore. So a lot of what we do depends on how the police conduct their investigations. So if you're saying, how do I deal with cases where I know the person's guilty and we lose, and that's happened, uh, it's frustrating. but. The jury is not entitled to know everything because, for example, say we have a confession. Here's a confession, but the person wasn't read his Miranda rights, tossed, and now we've got to prosecute the case without it, and the jury acquits. I'm like, Ugh. you can't go up to the jurors after and say, do you see this? This is a confession. You can't do that. So what you do is, the way I deal with it is I say, I know we will see them again. I know this person will be back, and we'll get him next time. But sadly, by that point, someone else will be a victim of his crime. Uh, now, you should ask criminal defense lawyers, because they represent people who 
in some cases they know are guilty, but they protect their rights by representing them, and sometimes they get, they get them off, and so you gotta, you know, hey, how do they feel then? Is that, I don't know. I'm not a criminal defense lawyer, so I, I can't tell you the answer to that question. Yeah. So, well, you guys are awesome. This is a great group.